Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. I'd like to share with you a text tonight. I've been wanting to share with uh, you folks for about four years, and I thought this is as good a time as any. It's in the New Testament. How about that? I want you to turn. We're going to look at about, um, oh, I guess there's five different select verses, but you can start with uh, Acts chapter 18. I want to show you the only couple in the Bible, the only married couple that really is elaborated upon. How many couples do you have in the Bible? Well, you've got obviously Joseph and Mary, but Mary gets uh, most of the billing right there. Uh, Joseph doesn't say a whole lot, and he dies early, like a lot of men don't say a lot, but die early in their marriages. That's kind of where Joseph was. You don't see a lot of it. Uh, you see Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, but uh, theirs is a very narrow uh, text. You see them just for a, a little brief couple of orations, and you never develop them. Uh, Felix and Drusilla, Agrippa and Bernice, uh, two Roman uh, politicians and their wives. The problem there is that both of their wives happen to be their family, their kin, which is called incest. That's not a real good pattern to be following, and so they're not real good to look at. You have really one couple in the New Testament that you look at. It's as if God, uh, of all of the couples that ever lived throughout Christianity, that, that he would put this one in the first century and highlight them in the New Testament, and they're the only ones you get to study. They are, in a sense, the perfect couple. I know they had their struggles, but they're almost pictured as the ideal couple. Their names are the old woman and the eagle. That's what they mean. Priscilla, the old woman. And in the Semitic mindset, the, the white head or the gray head is the crown of wisdom. She is the wise woman, the godly woman, Priscilla, sometimes called Prisca. And Aquila means the eagle, the idea of nobility, one who waits upon the Lord and mounts up with wings as eagles. They are uh, a Jewish couple, and they are fast friends of the Apostle Paul, and I just want to show you how they're depicted. Let me, at the very outset, just show you a survey of what the New Testament says just a compendium on this couple. Paul meets them early in the uh, 50 ADs right here on his second missionary journey in Acts 18. It says, After these things he, went, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he came to them. So these are two Christian Jews living in Rome, and they have to leave by this anti-Semitic um, legislation by the Roman uh, leader of the day. And so they leave, and they come to this seacoast town, get off the boat, and there in Corinth they meet the Apostle Paul. And it says in 3, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And so they move the Apostle Paul in to live with them. And he is quite a hot item. And they move him in, identify themselves with him. And we see that uh, Paul gets uh, essentially run out of Corinth. And in verse 18, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. They drop everything to do mission work. And they leave with the Apostle Paul. Already you see that this is a, com a couple that has no rights on their, um, uh, where they live. They are hospitable. They have no rights on their life and their plans. They abandon all to follow the Apostle Paul. And they do so. And in verse 19, he came to Ephesus and left them there. And so he heads on back to uh, his home church in Antioch. And they stay there in Ephesus. More about that in a moment. And while they are there, they encounter this fellow in verse 24, named Apollos. And in verse 24 of chapter 18, he is a brilliant 
newly converted Christian, but at the end of verse 25, he is only acquainted with the teachings of John the Baptist concerning Jesus. He needs to be taught more fully. It's not that what he knows is wrong, but what he knows is a secondary level. He needs college credit. And along come this couple. And in verse 26, he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. Now let me make a point about this. That's not the way that you would list a couple. It's always Joseph and Mary. It's Agrippa and Bernice. It's uh, Felix and Drusilla. It's at the opening of their mentioning in the New Testament, it is Aquila and his wife Priscilla. He's the leader. But all but one other time that they're mentioned, it's Priscilla and Aquila. And it is believed that the reason that you change that around, which is contrary to how you would do in the culture, is because, and um, this may not sound politically correct, but the woman is simply the more vocal of the two. And so she is the one that is, that is um, vocal. She is the one that is pronounced. Uh, Aquila is this strong, steady type that makes very hard decisions. Bring in Paul. Move. Go with him to uh, over here. We're going to move the Ephesian church in our home, which is what he will do. But she apparently is more talkative. All right. And so in verse 26, it does mention a plural pronoun. He had something to say. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So this couple is not only hospitable, they are not only committed, they are not only devoted to missions, but they are also so skilled that they can take, other than the Apostle Paul, the greatest New Testament scholar, and they can teach him, and he will receive their education. They are scholastic. They are doctrinally sound as well as all of these other things. When you see them again mentioned is in uh, the book of Romans. And I'd like you to look at Paul's benediction in chapter 16 of Romans. Romans 16. When Paul says, these people greet you, the first ones he mentions in verse 3 are people that are very close to him. And he gives Prisca and Aquila the highest of all commendations. Prisca is a pet name. And apparently this woman was close enough, she and Aquila to Paul, that he could call her by her nickname, Prisca. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. How would you like to have that said about you at the end of your life? That you were yoked with the Apostle Paul in commitment, evangelism, and discipleship. That's Priscilla and Aquila. And in verse 4, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles, meaning the reason that I am alive is that this couple laid their life down and put me in their home. They laid it down. They didn't play it safe. They took risks. They gave up their home. They gave up where they were living and followed me. They moved the Ephesian church, as I'll show you a minute, into their home. This couple didn't play it safe. They are missionary-minded. They are scholars. They're fellow workers for the gospel. And they take risks. Something else about them. At the very end of 1 Corinthians. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 16. And I'll explain these to you in a moment. But in 1 Corinthians 16, you see them again. In verse 19, Paul writes Corinthians from Ephesus, which is where he dropped off this couple. And here he says, in verse 19, the churches of Asia greet you, among which Ephesus is one. Aquila and Prisca, greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Now, if you know anything about the Ephesian church, um, the Ephesian church was a place Paul stayed for three years there in Ephesus. And it grew so heated that um, it was felt that he was um, 
taking the goddess Diana and removing her from her place of preeminence in the Ephesian pantheon of, of gods and goddesses. And they had a riot against Paul. And 20,000 people gathered in this amphitheater crying, great is Artemis or Diana of the Ephesians, throwing dust into the air. And uh, Paul left ultimately because this was such what he called the wild beast of Ephesus. It said he had the sentence of death within himself, writing to the Corinthians about his experience in Ephesus. I had the sentence of death within myself, but God delivered me from so great a peril of death. Uh, he said in writing about the, the resurrection to the Corinthians, he said, if, it, if you're not raised from the dead, why, if it was just from human motives, would I, would I quarrel and struggle with wild beasts at Ephesus? I mean, think about it. 20,000 people want your life. And it said that Paul tried to go into the amphitheater, but his buddies held him back. Matter of fact, it says the non-believers who were his buddies held him back. So this is a very hotbed of Christianity, is the Ephesian church. As a matter of fact, they're the church that gets the most press of any New Testament church. Paul leaves Timothy as the apostolic delegate there that was Paul's boy. Um, the Ephesian church had written to him uh, Revelation, Colossians comes to him, Ephesians obviously comes to him. Um, first, second Timothy are to Ephesus. It is believed that John wrote first, second, third John from Ephesus. So this church gets a lot of press. And it's in that place that Paul's key couple is there. And in this hotbed, they say, Paul, you can live with us. Oh, that was in Corinth. They're in Ephesus. They said, you can put the church here. We'll put them in our house. Now, you've heard me talk about Lady Claire, all Christians, where only God knows for sure who they are. This is not Priscilla and Aquila. They take risks. Paul, stay with me. Church, meet here. We'll lay it on the line. That's Priscilla and Aquila. You can have my home, and you can have my life. What a couple. The last mention of them is almost 20 years later. At the end of Paul's life, they're still alive and still in Ephesus. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's swan song, and look at who he mentions last of all. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is Paul's last writing. It is about, not quite, but about 20 years after he has met them. He met them in 50. This is, this is in the mid-60s. Call it 15 years. And at the end of his life, I want to show you what kind of people they are. This is an older couple now. Verse 19. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Now, what does that mean? He groups the household of Onesiphorus with Priscilla and Aquila. If you'll turn back two pages to chapter 1, I'll show you what I think they're doing. Onesiphorus was a guy who lost his life. If you look at chapter 1 of 2 Timothy in verse 15, let me show you why I think Priscilla and Aquila are taking care of the widow and the children of Onesiphorus. Paul exerts Timothy in this um, tumultuous area of Ephesus not to be afraid. Verse 8, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Verse 7, God had given us a spirit of timidity. Verse 6, kindle afresh the gift of God. Verse 12, I am not ashamed. Verse 13, restain the standard. 14, guard the, through the Holy Spirit the treasure entrusted to you. Chapter 2, verse 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ. Do y'all see that every verse is a pep talk of Paul to the next generation of saying, Padna, don't back off when it gets tough. Stick your nose in there. Take the heat. Take the hit. Well, look at the example he gives in verse 15, 16, 17, 18 as to how to be a man of God. It's a guy named Onesiphorus. Verse 15, you're aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. They were, these were two top guys that when it got hot, they abandoned him. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus. Why does he say the house of Onesiphorus? Because Onesiphorus is dead. This guy 
laid his life on the line when it was tough, and it cost him his life. It said in verse 16, He was not refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. When he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. That's talking about his reward at the judgment because he's dead. They killed him because he refused to be silent about his love of God and his love for the Apostle Paul and New Testament doctrine. And when he's in Rome in prison, Onesiphorus looks for him, and in verse 18, you know what services he rendered at where? Ephesus, when it gets tough. Ephesus, Rome, when it's tough. He says, there is Onesiphorus. Any of you guys play football, know what it is when it's fourth and two? You got to have somebody that delivers. Uh, Emmett is a great picture of this. Man, he will stick his nose in there. You've you got to love watching this guy play. When, when you've got to have it, when it's on the line, Emmett Smith can deliver. This is Paul's Emmett Smith. When it's tough, when he's in Rome, when he's in Ephesus, when the heat's on, a lot of guys hook him. But this guy eagerly searches for him, renders service for him. Paul's proud of him, and he lost his life. Question, who's going to take care of Mrs. Onesiphorus? Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. At the end of their lives, this older couple says, you come live with me. Bring your kids. We're going to be the answer to Paul's prayer for God to grant mercy. We're here for you. Are you all sufficiently impacted by this couple? There are some. Christians, hospitable, courageous, evangelistic, scholarly, committed to disciple making. When the heat's on, they'll take the risk and at the end of their life, they'll do what they can do for the gospel cause, even if it's just ministering to a dead man's widow. Whoa. Folks, do you understand why they're the classic couple of the New Testament? You don't have to study anybody else, just them. The noble man and the wise woman. Who should we teach Priscilla and Aquila to? Obviously couples. Singles. You know what happens whenever I teach couples stuff to couples? They all come up and they go, I wish I'd have heard this when I was single. <laughs> well, I'm about to take your excuse away. I'm, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Somehow I never got around to it. I'm going to show a group of singles the biblically perfect couple. All right? Now, I'm going to show you four things about them. Granted, the compendium of material you have. You just write it down. Tattoo it on your arm that you don't miss these principles. I don't want to make you nervous, but if you don't do these right, you're going to have a life of hell. <laughs> Was that emphatic enough? You will. Number one, write this down. This couple is together. They're never mentioned separately. It's never Priscilla dragging the dead wood Aquila. that you see so often. It is never this noble eagle of a man longing to do things, but his carping wife will not let him because of her faithlessness. This is not Aquila of the attic or Aquila of the desert place because of his contentious, dripping faucet. This couple is together in ministry. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother cleave to his wife, and the two become what? One. You are one sexually. You are one emotionally. You are one socially. You are one financially. And you are one ministerially. Believers, be not yoked to unbelievers. When you get married, you are in a yoke. Now, who is this oxen listening to? They're not going to walk with you if they are not following the constraints of Jesus. 
And that is Priscilla and Aquila. They are together in the ministry. And I hate to harp on my wife, but she's the only one I got. And to tell you about her, you know, when I do my Bible study in Louisville among businessmen at 7 to 8 on Tuesday mornings, I go home and my house is crowded with the wives of international students that my wife meets with and does evangelism, and I can't get into my house. She took over the home and she uses it for the international wives evangelism. Uh, every Wednesday, she takes off to the church and she has moms there, young mothers in our church, that she helps them on the art of being a mother. Friday, she meets with the leaders that do the small groups for moms. She comes to me last year. She says, do we have X amount of money in our account? I said, yeah, why? I'm going to Venezuela. <laughs> May I ask why? She's going to do evangelism and discipleship. Do you know what it's like to have a wife like that that runs with you that I don't always have to be dreaming of things, but I can't get her to follow. I don't know what it's like. When I come in from morning studies, my wife rolls out and has her quiet time, uh, usually around 7.30. I come in, she has it a very special spot in the house. I know where, she's be, where she'll be. She's post right there, and she's studying the Word. At nighttime, when she goes to bed, she has a little uh, read through the Bible in a year deal that she does, and she has her second quiet time. And there she has it in the evening in her spot with the lamp on and she reads her Bible. Uh, she's clockwork. I know where she's going to be. I can't tell you the times that I have seen great married men long to do great things, but they can't because they are disqualified by their wives. I can't tell you the, the, the pained women that I have counseled who dream of great things. But as they do them, they ache because they know the area of intimacy that they cannot share with their husband because their husband is dead to the things of God. Man, that is pain. You know what a joy it is to be married to a man, to a woman, that when you lay there at night and you pray, that you pray together for your common ministries for God to do great things with you. Listen, folks. This is so important that when Abraham sought a wife for his son Isaac, he made his um, chief servant Eliezer swear by God he would not take a Canaanite woman. Then he said, well, what if the woman won't leave where she is to follow me? He said, God forbid if you take my son back and compromise. You're free from your vow. We will not compromise. She's got to be a believer and a committed believer who will trust the promises of God along with Isaac are no go. Incidentally, when was Isaac when he got married? Forty. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> Forty. The time of death. <laughs> Forty. <laughs> Israel is forbidden to take unbelieving mates. Ezra and Nehemiah had national divorces from Canaanite women and unbelieving women. That's how important it is. If I was the devil and I had lost you to the electing purposes of God and he had saved your soul, I can still quench your voice. And one thing that I can do is I can shackle you down with dead wood. And I've got you. So who are you dating right now? Are they the kind of person that you would long to marry someday because of the quality of their lives? You say, well, I'm just dating them. If they are not potential people of such character that you would marry them, uh, you are just playing with fire. Trust me. Let me show you another thing about them. This couple is beneficial to each other. Bene, bueno, bona. They are good. That's what beneficial means. They are good for each other. This guy, Aquila, never has a problem making hard decisions, leaving Italy, staying in Corinth, moving in Paul, following him to Ephesus, moving in the church, because this woman honors him. But you know what's odd? 
This woman flourishes under him because this man is committed. I mean, he'll put her, in a sense, out front because that's her gift. And he'll let this woman flourish. He'll develop her to be everything that he, that he can be. I know in my life, uh, I had to make a hard decision. I was at a, a church. They, they got rid of a guy who was the pastor there who worked for Billy Graham, and he was, boy, he was great. And they brought in this guy who had a history of being a liberal. And I said to my wife, I'm going to go talk with this guy, and I'm going to see where he is. And at this time, Teresa and I, we had seen our college, we took a college group of 15 college kids, and we watched it go to about 160 in about three years. It was really good. Great ministry. But I said, I cannot ask my kids in our college group to come upstairs and listen to this guy. It's going to destroy their faith. And I'm going to go talk to him. And I said, Teresa, if he isn't right, you pack him. And I left. I went and talked to this guy, asked him some questions. I couldn't just get this guy to agree to the multiplication table. Uh, he didn't hold to nothing. And I walked in the house, and she was looking at me. She was folding a towel. I'll never forget it. And she's folding this towel, and she's kind of holding it here. And I said, pack them. She never asked a question. She said, are you sure? I said, pack them. And she had to leave, go live with her parents in East Texas while I finished out that semester of Dallas Seminary. I made a hard call for the sake of truth. And my wife was with me. Um, I had chances after that to take a couple of churches. One was one of the largest Baptist churches in the country as far as being a youth guy. I was a killer with youth back when I was young. I go serve them. Uh, or I could have taken a college church out in Abilene, out around the area of McMurray that ministered to the Methodist community, and they asked me to come there. Great possibility. And then there was this church in Denton that was meeting in a dance hall, about 70 college students. And you could shake them down for about 60 bucks a week. All right? They offered me the grand sum of $400 a month to come with them. And I looked at this church or that church or this church in the dance hall. And Teresa and I went and visited the church, and there was a Dallas guy that was pastoring there in Denton. And uh, boy, it was a far cry from what we had as a model for a church. But I said to Teresa, I said, this guy, his name is Mel Summerall, he's got his head on straight, and he knows where he's going, and I want to be where this guy is going. I said, these other guys are good, but I want to be where this guy is. I said, what do you say? You want to take this renowned Baptist church, or you want to take this renowned Methodist church, or you want to meet in the Optimus Gym dance hall on Highway 77? <laughs> All right. One of the first Sundays we met there, we got ready to start the service, and we heard some groaning back in the back, went in the women's restroom, and the night before they'd had a party in the dance hall, and this woman had drunk and passed out on the floor. <laughs> now, I checked my seminary notes. What do you do, Walt? <laughs> you go and put in a car and haul her off, you know? And so that's how we started our ministry. <laughs> Teresa said, are you sure? Them. So that's where we ended up. And you know what? God is blessed. I was able to make some hard calls because of my wife. Uh, when I was asked to do Metro four years ago, I already had to teach ten times a week. Doug had me come and speak here a couple of times, and Doug Hudson says, could you do this permanently? And I said to Doug, quote, would you like to see me divorced? That's what I said to him. And I really enjoyed it. But I wasn't about to say to my wife, Monday's my day off, all right? And I wasn't about to say to my wife, hey, I want to do this other study. But you know what? She watched me. And she watched how I enjoyed this. She saw the fruit coming from it. And she says to me, you got to do Metro. She made the call, see? She wouldn't stand in the way even where I wouldn't want to go. That's the kind of woman that she is. And do you know what? That woman, and I can say it in the Lord, she has flourished under me. 
I have looked at the qualities that she has, and I've taken everything I can from my money to my time to my life and poured it into her. I want to do with my wife, guys, like Jesus does with us, to nourish and cherish us and develop us and present to himself the church in all her glory. You guys, are any of y'all controlling? Somehow, I don't know how men get to thinking this, but somehow they get to thinking that a good husband is a strong husband and a strong husband is one who is a leader and a leader takes away all freedoms from his wife. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus Christ develops us. Your job as a husband is not to squelch your wife and to fit her into your image. It is to see what God has given you and to pour everything into what her talents and abilities are and to make life easy. You're to be her personal support board to care for her. My wife got off on a photography click, uh, kick one time. Hey, I was going to buy her a dark room. I was. Uh, she, whatever she gets into, her thing is my thing. And I'm into developing her. So you don't want to squelch your wife. And you girls, you don't want to be something that your husband has to continually pray that God will change you to give him the freedom to do something. Aquila benefited from this woman. Priscilla flourished under this man. They are beneficial for each other. I'll show you something else about it. Romans 16. They take risks. They don't play it safe. You are going to find when you get married. Now listen to me. If I was a yeller, I would commence to screaming right here. <laughs> but I'm not. But just put a note. Nelson would scream if he were thus. 1 Corinthians 7 warns couples about the distractions of marriage. I can't tell you how many times in our ministry I have seen a committed college guy and a committed college girl, a committed single guy, a committed single girl, get married and the two committed singles join together to make one mediocre couple. And they don't get mediocre because of sin. It's because of responsibility. All of this guy and this girl, they're all dreaming about China and Romania and Latvia and doing great things for God. All of a sudden they get married, a kid comes, and they want that kid to go to a, a college and they think about what it's going to cost. And all of a sudden the guy in the name of responsibility starts pulling more hours. And pretty soon that girl isn't thinking about China. I mean, her view of the world gets about as big as a box of Kimbys, all right? To diaper that kid, that's all they're thinking of. Another kid comes, another kid comes, and all of a sudden they give up the ministry. And it, it gets to where they think about the good old days when they used to read the Bible, share the gospel, and do discipleship when they were singles. I've seen that a million times. The good old days when I used to do ministry before I got married and graduated commitment into mediocrity and I left the Great Commission to the single guys. Not these guys. They risk their necks. And Paul warns you. You know what 1 Corinthians tells you singles? He says if you can stay single, stay single. Because he who is married is concerned about the affairs of the world, how he may please his wife. And she who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And her interests are divided. I say this, Paul says, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is seemly and to secure undistracted devotion to God. When you get married, you take a monkey on your back that is called responsibility. And you have to feed that monkey. And he grows into King Kong. <laughs> and he will crush the life out of you. One of my favorite movies is The Magnificent Seven. Remember Bernardo? Uh, who's the guy? He's always killing everybody. Bronson, that's it. Charles Bronson plays Bernardo. And he's got these uh, little, little guys, little Mexican kids that adopt him. He's in Bronson's The Orphan, if you saw the movie. Great scene. And they say, Bernardo, if you get killed, we want to bury you so we can bring flowers to your grave every day. Nice kids. 
All right. We bring flowers to your grave every day. And Bronson says, well, why don't you follow your fathers? They're right over there. Our fathers, they do not handle the gun like you. They are cowards. And Bronson grabs those kids and just paddles them. And he says, let me tell you something. He says, I'm a gunfighter. I have no commitments. I have no this. I have no that. He said, no one will live with me. Your fathers, they have this big responsibility, this big rock on their back called responsibility. And it crushes them until it kills them. They are the ones that you should follow. Not me. He stands up and somebody shoots him. Boom. Right there. This is a great scene. <laughs> and I don't think Charles Bronson had 1 Corinthians 7 in mind when he said it. <laughs> but, but God could do a takeoff on him there in 1 Corinthians 7 and say, when you get married, you take a responsibility on your back and it will crush you. Be careful. I'll promise you it's going to happen to you. You're going to think of the good old days when you used to be able to be footloose, fancy, free, do a lot of great things for God when you were single. You guys, when you're single, how do you move when you have to move? Get a bed sheet, right? <laughs> Throw your junk in it. <laughs> Fold it up. <laughs> Throw in a truck. See? Now, you would think that when you get married, you're going to have two bed sheets, right? <laughs> Can you say beacons? That's what you're going to get. Well, that's the way it is. See. So, this couple takes risks. One of my heroes, C.T. Studd, started a missionary work to uh, China, to Africa. He was a great English athlete back in the late 1800s, became a Christian, committed himself to Christ. His father was extremely wealthy and gave his sons this incredible amount of money for the time. Been a lot of money today. And he felt that what he should do was to leave his money, give to the poor, go and follow Jesus. He took it literally. And he did. And uh, he left 5,000 pounds so he and his future wife would have something to live on. And C.T. Studd's wife said to him, you did what? He said, I kept 5,000. He said, she said to him, you feel that God told you to give everything to him and you let me stand in the way to take 5,000 pounds. She said, give it all. And he gave it to a fledgling institution in Chicago that was called Moody Bible that did quite well. But that's the kind of wife he married. We're not going to play with any net, CT. Give it away. What a woman. Bill Bright, I know for a fact, and I say this because he said it, he gave $50,000 of his retirement to start a discipleship training center in Thailand. He won a million dollars for the Templeton Award for humanitarian causes, took that million, and he and his wife gave it away for the purpose of uh, uh, a movement in the area of prayer and fasting. Uh, risk. You don't want to play it safe as couples. I've got a lawyer in my church that he and his wife leave two weeks a year, go to Burma to preach. I've got a dentist in my church named Jim Roberts. He and his wife leave during the year and go to Indonesia to preach. A guy named Gene Welburn and his wife Lorraine, they leave and they go to Burma also to preach. Uh, got a couple in my church named Don and Karen Kemp. They looked around at our demographics and said, you know, we got a whole lot of white collar graduates in our church. What about these guys over in this apartment complex that don't get out of high school? I said, I don't know. They said, have we ever thought about start reaching in there and taking some of us not to come to Denton Bible and penetrate with the church? And he and his wife Karen left everything, left all their support there at Denton Bible. And now that is their church, along with two other couples. They take risks. And that's the way you want to be, dreaming in your marriage about what greater things you and your wife and you and your husband can do. Uh, my wife and I, we so enjoyed training and discipling men. She said to me one time, what would happen if they never had to leave? I said, how do you mean? She said, why don't we build onto our house and move them in? 
How many women you ever know that want to move in four hairy-legged men into their home with their husband? And that's what my wife said. Let's move them in. We go take a $30,000 loan, move them in. We got four guys in the house. Now she cooks for seven guys instead of just three. Now, that's the kind of woman that I'm married. Takes risks. Is that the way you're going to be? Priscilla and Aquila. I'll tell you the last thing about them. At the end of their life, this couple is still doing what they can for the gospel ministry. All the way at the end. The fellow that started Denton Bible was the oldest graduate, second career guy in the history of Dallas Seminary. Started at 52 years of age is when he graduated Dallas Seminary. Was making six figures as the um, steel superintendent of production at CFNI Steel in Pueblo, Colorado. Whenever you go skiing, you have to go up through Pueblo, that big CFNI Steel. The guy with me in ministry was the production supervisor. Made a chunk of money. Left everything. Sold his house. Came to Dallas. Worked as a night watchman. Put himself through seminary. Started when he was 48. Finished when he was 52. Church grew to the point, I came to the point that I became senior pastor. You think he retired? He's now about 75. He and his wife said, what can we do? They get to looking at the paper at all the great evangelism Campus Crusade's doing. And he says, I wonder what they're doing to start churches over there with the Jesus film. Calls Bill Bright. Says, we want to travel with you and see what you're doing. Travels with Bright sees that they're seeing all these converts, but they're not seeing any churches. Mel says, we know how to start churches. He began a program called the BTCP, the Bible Training Center for Pastors. He and his wife travel about 40 weeks a year in places like Latvia, Romania, uh, Thailand. I don't know how many times he's come back early because he picked up some kind of parasite. He and his, his wife had to come back early because... Uh, uh, she was an older woman had to have surgery to tie up a bladder because she had such a problem overseas. She's 75 years old, trekking around over there with Mel. They went and helped start a church work in Tibet. You ever been to Tibet? There are yaks in Tibet. <laughs> it's a hard place. And there they are in Tibet. Now that's the way you do it. See, to the end of your life, you're trying to figure it out. He told me he can't wait for the day when they get too old where they can't live in their house anymore and take care of themselves so they can go to a retirement village and share the gospel with their generation. <laughs> that's the way it is. And I'll assure you, when he dies, there will be some emergency room nurse that hears the gospel with that guy's dying breath. And his wife, Patty, will say to the nurse while he's dying, listen to him. It's <laughs> the kind of people they are. It's a pretty good couple, aren't they? They're together in the ministry. That was your first point. They're beneficial. They flourish. They don't hold each other back. <clears throat> Thirdly, they take risk, and they are faithful till the end. Would you like a Priscilla, you guys? Who do you think she's praying about meeting? A noble man, Aquila. Is that you? Ladies, would you like this kind of stud? Aquila, eagle boy? Huh? Instead of, you know, Joe Bob the slug over here? You want eagle boy. That's who you want to marry. Is that who you girls are holding out for? Who are you dating right now? Is he one of these guys you got to bludgeon once a month to go to Snow's Pace Church someplace who sits in the back and leaves early who don't know the words or the songs who throws in his chips at the end of a, you know, a plate, you know, tosses in his change? Is that the kind of guy you're going to hold out for? That's the kind of marriage you're going to get. Those guys get real old real quick. They really do. They're made out of tin. They just plink. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be as nasty as I can without cussing. <laughs> I want to totally discourage you from marrying dead, mud individuals 
because they, they're no fun to be married to. Guys like that are okay to pick up a check. <laughs> but that's all. And so, ladies, if you've got these little top water guys, you know, that just kind of flip from pond to pond, and they don't want to get into the real ongoings of the Spirit of God because they don't want to get vulnerable, they don't want to get committed. You know, they're just kind of paddling in the eddies over there. You ever been white water rafting? Where, I mean, you get out in the middle of that thing and the current grabs you and hauls you down the river. It gets real scary. And so what you do is you just kind of hang around over here, you know, with your rubber ducky and Barney. <laughs> <laughs> if that's where you want to be, don't marry those guys. And guys, don't marry those kind of girls that want to marry. Get you a woman with some grit to her. Get a Ruth Gleaning out there. Get some uh, Zipporah who's shepherding. Get some uh, Rachel who's shepherding. Some Rebecca who's watering camels. Get a woman who, Psalm, Proverbs 31, makes her arms strong. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Get some woman with some, some fathoms to her. See, Those are the kind you're going to love question is, I'll just ask you a very penetrating question, uh, this Priscilla type, that's God's daughter. That's God's daughter. Now, why, if God loves that daughter, would he bestow someone like you on that girl? Huh? Would you be seen as a blessing, a boon to her life? Or would people always have some kind of philosophic question as to how a loving God could give a guy like you <laughs> to a woman like that? If God's so loving, why would he give Joe Bob to that woman? <laughs> Girls, here's this Aquila type. Here's this eagle over here. He's soaring high. God loves him. God's going to use him. Why would God bestow you on him? Some dead-in-the-water girl, don't read her Bible, don't share the gospel, don't do missionary works. All she thinks about is what she can buy and possess and clutch to herself. Why would he want to bless him with you? See? I mean, I'm a father. I've got a boy. I, I cherish my... Uh, I've got a... Uh, what do you call them to marry your kid? <laughs> Daughter-in-law. That's what I've got. <laughs> I have no women in my family. Man, my boy would bring home these different girls. You know, they're sweet, all right kind of girls, but man, he brought home Amanda from Ennis, Texas. All right. Um, all region volleyball player. Keep the gene pool high. So. <laughs> Little bitty scamp. Leroy, can she play volleyball? Great heart for God, great servant, never made a bee in her life. And I said to her, well, you and my kid got a lot in common because he ain't made too many bees. <laughs> I was so happy when he married her. I wanted to, to bestow that girl on my kid. See, my younger son has a girl he and enjoys hanging around with these girls, bringing them by. And, uh, you know, I watch them. And I see these girls that, you know, and I'll see one that doesn't have this real heart for God. And I go, I don't know, Jim. But boy, he'll bring one by, and uh, I'll see every once in a while. That may not be her, but that's sure like her. And keep your eye on that one right there. Well, that's what God wants to bestow you upon. What kind of single are you becoming to merit a mate like this? Well, let's pray about this. Mr. Walt Nussbaum, come up here. Close us up. <coughs> Father in heaven, I thank you for this evening, this enjoyable compendium and review of the classic couple, the classic man, the man who flew high, the eagle, for this classic woman a woman wise beyond her years who would devote themselves to the gospel cause, the gospel's people, who could give their home, who could teach, who could pick up roots and follow, 
who could put in apostles or put in widows, whether they were young or whether they're old, whether it's in Italy, whether it's in Corinth, whether it's in Ephesus, wherever they were, they were committed to join up in harness and to benefit one another. That this man could be all that you made him and this woman could be all that she dreamed uh, because of this classic marriage. I pray for these men and these women that they would become the type of men and women right now, that the type of men and women that they would long to marry, even now somewhere, are praying that they could meet. And we shall ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Mm.